It's my pleasure today to introduce on this podcast, Inga Hubrix. Inga is the Senior Global Vice President of Sustainability, Security and Corporate Communications for Radisson Group. We're here at Studio Red at the Radisson Red Hotel in Dubai Silicon Oasis, and Inga is visiting Dubai this week for COP28. Inga, it's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Chris. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. I think it's very timely for you to be here. COP is a huge thing in Dubai at the moment, and I think the agenda points that we can cover and hearing your personal posture as well as professional posture on those is going to be fascinating for the listeners and people who are watching this as well. Let's start off a little bit by talking about the lady behind the job title. Radisson Group is a huge organization. Over 100,000 people work for Radisson Group, present in 116 countries. But you're an individual just like everybody else, Inga. And I think it would be really rewarding for us to hear about who you are, how you've got to the position that you're in. Yeah, with pleasure. So actually, uh, I'm Belgian, so I'm from a small country, but with a very international mindset, I would say. And uh, as you said, I'm the head of sustainability and security in Radisson, so a global group. Um, first of all, it's an exciting business to be part of because it's a people business and you get to meet exciting people every day. Yeah. So that's lovely. And doing sustainability in such an environment is fantastic. And I, I, so I feel very privileged and very lucky to be in the role that I'm in. Um, and actually, I have, if you look at it from a career perspective, I have two big blocks in my career and in the middle is a long sailing trip. So um, I started out as being uh, in IT, business development, software, so also international, but a different business, definitely. And then I uh, went sailing halfway around the world, took four years career break, and during that time, actually realized how important it is to protect the planet. And so I was thinking, wouldn't it be great when I came back, if I could do something with my international experience and then also try and do something really useful to say to in a company to bring them to more sustainability. And then I don't know how it happened, but I got hired as the head of sustainability for Toyota in Europe. And then after a few years, um, looked for another challenge and then found, found that with uh, what is now Radisson Hotel Group. Wow. What was it? What was the moment, if there was one, on that four years out, that sailing trip, where the pivot happened and you realized what you just described about the planet? You know, the point is when you, when you sail, you visit so many beautiful, very remote locations. Many of them are islands. And unfortunately, when you sail across the ocean, when you do an ocean crossing like we've done, um, you just see pollution. You see beauty, of course, a lot of beauty, but you also see pollution. You see uh, the large trailing nets that they use to catch tuna, but they catch dolphins and turtles and all the stuff with it. You see plastic on all these islands. You know, the windward side of many of these remote islands are just so polluted with plastic. And these are locations that are not in this by any means, right? They are, they don't have a responsibility. I mean, they do, of course, within their own boundaries, but, and then also the, I think it's, it's important to protect those kind of remote communities with their own, their own cultural identity. So, um, yeah, these are the moments, you know, watching that when you, when I said, okay, let's try and here I am. So it worked. Was there any particular island or somewhere that you went to where it was really arresting what you had to, what you witnessed? And uh, many, I mean, you go to many islands in the Pacific, it, it's very, um, prevalent. Mm. Yeah. Anything around Marquesas, Tuamotus, those kind of places. True. So now you're in the position that you're in, you're an extremely influential lady when it comes to your opportunity, not only within Radisson Group, but also the peer group that you've got globally with more and more organizations embracing corporate social responsibility and their obligations towards the environment. How does it feel on a daily basis when you wake up and you've got that kind of accountability, not only for the group, but to the planet? I think it's uh, the job is never done. So I'm a very positive person. I'm not negative. There's, of course, a lot of big, big challenges. But um, I believe we can tackle them and we need to. So if you see where we've come, 
uh, from. We have a long tradition of being a responsible company because our origins as Radisson are Scandinavian. Mm -hmm. So in the last century, we already had uh, an environmental policy when nobody was talking about this. But of course, being Scandinavian in origin, we had it. And from there, it was always kind of present. But I would say that since the pandemic, things have accelerated enormously. I mean, the conversations are happening now at COP. Uh, it's about decarbonization in the private sector. We need to reach net zero by 2050 everywhere or earlier. Uh, it's about the big challenges of what do we do with the built environments? Built environments, not just hotels, but any building, uh, represents 40% of global emissions, 40. Cooling is a big issue. Cement is an issue. Of course, we talk about transportation. And I believe, I really believe that hospitality can play a role because, of course, we have, we work with owners who own hotel buildings. We have our people, but also we can touch millions of travelers every year because of what we do. We interact with people from everywhere. So we also have an opportunity and a responsibility to inform everyone and make sure we drive responsible travel. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know how many people stay at Radisson Hotels a year? Mm, no, but we can give you that number. It must it's be millions. millions. I mean, it must be we millions. have 200,000 hotel rooms. I can't do the math so quickly, but yeah. you know, good occupancy times 365, yeah. It's a great opportunity Millions. to influence yeah, people yeah, yeah. and then regular loyal customers that become part of the culture that you create around sustainability. We try to. That's one of the things we try to do because one of the things you get in these studies every single time, and especially also with the younger generations, um, is that they want to travel sustainably, but they don't know how. And so the more we inform them about what we do, like here in the Radisson Red, You've got great communication to engage the, 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 the guests. And the more we engage them, the better it is. Like, for example, now during, sorry, during COP, we, um, we have made all our hotel stays net zero. So we call that net zero nights. I love that. It's 13 days, our 16 hotels in the UAE. And the way we do that is, of course, we first try to reduce the footprint of a hotel, right? All the energy use, everything you got that's contributing to a footprint, we reduce it. And then we take the electricity and we convert that to renewable electricity. There's ways in which you can do that. Um, and then we take the remaining footprint and we offset that with carbon offsets, which are of a very high quality standard. And that's how you get to net zero nights. So we're gonna be offsetting quite a lot of uh, 1500 tons of carbon just now in these uh, 13 days, and we are converting 3,500 megawatts to renewable energy. You mentioned that um, there's the 13 nights, or the 13 days of COP. Oh, yeah. You're obviously spending a lot of time at COP this week. We're lucky enough to have grabbed some time for this interview with you now. Talk to me about COP, Inga. Well, I must admit it's my first COP. So this is new to me. Uh, it's important for Radisson Hotel Group to be here, but it's new. So it's important for me as well. It's a uh, learning. I think it's, uh, it's a huge event and the way it makes a difference on the private sector, there's a lot of private sector participation here, is, um, is the networking and the connections you make. Just being like I was yesterday in a panel by the U United Nations World Tourism Organization, basically with a few people who are trusted peers and I know, but there were other people there. And just that conversation about, okay, where are we going to focus next year? What are we going to do together? Meeting new people who can also help you with that or who cover another aspect of what needs to be done in a destination, for example, talking about islands, right? The, the, the richness and um, the natural value that is in uh, the corals, for example, that is also key in calculating what we can do in the destinations. Those kind of connections all happen here at COP. And that's why it's still so important to have a huge COP with lots of people because people meet, they make plans, they build trust and they can move forward together. Yeah, absolutely. Are you finding that within the sector, there are peers within other 
uh, hospitality organizations that you're able to spend that kind of time with and engender trust with to talk about the relevant topics for your sector at COP? At COP and elsewhere. I mean, we are members as Radisson Hotel Group. We are members of a, a number of key organizations in the hospitality industry. One is the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance and the other is the World Travel and Tourism Council. There's more. And as I mentioned, we are also working with the United Nations World Tourism Organization. So in terms of sustainability, those, those are the three most important ones for us. Um, and actually, you're asking about our peers. I mean, we know each other. We're actually friends mm -hmm. in a way that we trust each other and we do things together because we know that there are things we, we cannot do alone. For example, we define tools to measure the carbon footprint of a hotel in a reliable way. And we all agree on how to do that so that when we do that, we go out with the same message. Together, we defined what is called the pathway to net positive hospitality. So we kind of set our North Star to say, okay, it's net zero, but even beyond that, and building on the messaging of people like, for example, Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever, he wrote a book about net positive. So we aspire to be net positive hotels. And then we all agree on what those steps look like. So we have defined four steps. We do that collectively. There's a training academy on it. So it's not just for us, but it's for the whole hospitality industry and the many SMEs that are out there, small and mid-sized enterprises that are out there. So we do these things collectively and there's more and more and more to come. There are a number of different axes that I want to ask you about, Inga, in terms of securing traction that, are, that the success of these initiatives are dependent on geographic, demographic. You mentioned industry ones such as SME up to enterprise level. What's your posture on those? How do you navigate all of those different axes so that with your global accountability, you feel as though you're making the kind of acceleration towards the outcomes that you want to achieve? Yeah. It's a, it's a good question, but it's it's a challenge that many companies have, yeah. of course, right? We're not the only ones who are global in more than 90 countries, um, et cetera. So I think the first thing is to set a target, right? And that target needs to be set with full um, engagement of the leadership of the company. And I have the privilege to work with a CEO who's fully behind this. It's part of our strategic plan for the company. So, and we committed to become net zero by 2050. Someone said earlier today, if you don't have an exam, you're not studying, right? So that's why you need a target to really know where you're going. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first thing. Of course, there's a lot of diversity. We represent 10 brands. There's 10 Radisson brands. A lot of them have Radisson in the name, but some others. So we're at Radisson Red, but there's Radisson Blue and Radisson Collection and Radisson, just a Radisson. Um, and in that variation, of course, you need to make sure that you explain how things can be done in all these different settings, whether a hotel is 50 rooms or it's a thousand rooms. Mm. So that is a variation we have. And then we have the cultural diversity of both our teams, which is great, of our guests, and also of the asset owners, because we operate hotels, but we don't own the buildings. So a key partner in that journey to net zero are the owners. And of course, there are owners, again, like the Silicon Oasis here, the owners of Radisson Red, who totally are with us on the journey to net zero. They have ensured that this hotel, for example, is LEED Platinum certified. So it's a really green building. And those owners, they set an example for the others. So I think the way we work is by setting the targets, creating the tools, training the staff, and also um, working with best practice examples because that inspires, right? It's a bit of a, we try to give a challenge. If the owners know that other owners in Dubai have built a lead platinum hotel, you know, this is a healthy competition yep. in the owner community. And the same happens with employees. I mean, we, uh, we do employee engagement campaigns on net zero. We are in the middle now of what's called Move to Zero, which is uh, a kind of gamified interaction with our hotels on good habits to move closer to net zero. And we create a bit of a competition and, you know, which hotel is going to win? And then they win a prize, which they can also dedicate on a little event. And, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. Create, show that it's possible 
and inspire others to get there. Mm. Inga, I'd like to focus in a little bit more on something that you mentioned earlier. People naturally gravitate towards the topic of transportation when they're talking about carbon footprints. Mm. And we're talking about hotels, hotel construction, green buildings, and that kind of positive, competitive feeling that can push things forward, progress. And you mentioned concrete. Now, I read this when I was doing research before this interview. Enlighten me onto the importance of concrete and its contribution towards making a more sustainable future. Yeah, I'm not an expert on concrete. Let me tell you that first. So, um, But what it actually is, is that the production of concrete is uh, requiring a lot of energy. So it's polluting in that sense, right? So regular concrete is quite polluting because of its production process. And of course, you know, when we know, actually today I was in a session with uh, the World Bank and uh, one of the panelists said that because of urbanization globally, the size of New York City is actually being added to the built environment every month and that's expected to continue in the next decade. Wow. So that's a lot of concrete, right? And so there are building materials and there are ways of being innovative about concrete that are less carbon intense. And that's why when you build a hotel, it's also very important to look at what building materials you use. And uh, for example, what concrete or other materials that they are circular or that their production process is actually less carbon intense. And that is possible. It happens. Now, the, the construction sector and cement particularly is one of the focus sectors also at COP here. So there's a lot of uh, consideration and action happening, but things are possible today to be more smart about using the kind of concrete you use and the way it's done um, to be less carbon intense. And there's calculation methods for that. So anyone who thinks about even constructing a house or constructing a, a commercial building or a hotel, it is possible, it can be modeled, the impact can be modeled. And in the end, uh, you're going to have a future-proof building if you use these kind of newer technologies. You can certainly see how adopting a similar philosophy across a number of different topics creates that kind of positive cascade that then becomes just the habits and the standard operating procedure of how businesses work and how people live their lives going forwards. Yeah, I think we need to rethink, right? I uh, I just wrote an article about the new net zero normal. It's, it's kind of how we need to think. Mm. It's really a transformation. And I think the younger generations, of course, they're very switched on so they can teach us. But um, we're not yet there. We're not yet there at creating those habits, really. Um, for example, we have, we have, we do have an increasing number of conversations with owners, whether they are in emerging or in uh, mature markets about their buildings, about how to build or c convert, like make, for example, an office building into a hotel, uh, to how to do that in a, in a carbon-friendly way, yeah. an energy-efficient way. I think you mentioned in one of your blogs that I read before this interview that the solutions we need for uh, a 1.5 degree future are mostly or all available today. Unpack that for me a bit, Inga. Well, actually, um, a lot of the solutions are available today. It's just not yet a habit of looking at them or using them. Actually, there's a great book called Project Drawdown, uh, which is actually the 100 solutions. It's a great book. It's the 100 solutions that can get us to a 1.5 degree future. Um, so for hotel buildings, I'm talking about, of course, the way they are built, the envelope of the building. Uh, if you're in a sunny country like here, put smart shading in, the orientation of your building. Do you know that by just designing a building, you can actually make it so much more energy efficient? And when you design an efficient building, it's only go it's, it's going to come at the same cost or maximum a 5% increase in building cost, which is going to pay back in your utility costs. So it's all when you're building a house, it's actually the same thing. Using renewables, renewable technology is here. Battery uh, storage is getting better and better. 
So we can, we, we're not doing that yet, but we could even start looking at microgrids for hotels. There's floating solar. I mean, there's so many innovations that are out there that actually can be used in a building or also in our day-to-day -day lives. Is the perception that they're expensive the reason why they aren't being adopted more quickly? I think that is one of the perceptions that is wrong. Uh, for many of these technologies and that persists it's like this idea you know when you talk to owners real estate owners they will say oh but it's 20 percent or 30 percent or 40 percent more expensive to build green and actually it is not there's great tools out there for example one of the, the ifc which is part of the world bank they have a tool to calculate this they promote sustainable building tools in emerging markets and you can actually go in put everything you know about your building in the tool, and then you will get the ROI of all these green solutions that you can just tick and select. So it's out there, but these perceptions actually still are prevalent, yeah. I sense the conviction that you've got around the ambition to be um, net zero by 2050 within Radisson Group. What are the metrics that you use and how are you tracking against that towards that ambition, Inga? Well, let me first start by saying that tracking uh, is something that we've been doing for a long time. We have already for 20 years in a row, we're publishing a yearly sustainability report. And those reports, of course, contain transparency about what we're doing. They t talk about what we're doing. Um, now, the frameworks of how you need to report on carbon footprints is a, an absolute carbon footprint. Uh, divided in scopes. So one and two is what you produce or buy as energy. And scope three is what your supply chain produces or what you use when you uh, use transportation or what your franchisees in our case, if you're a franchised operator, which we also are, um, what they use as energy. So those footprints, there is uh, generally accepted metrics, the total tons of carbon, and then the intensities like your how much carbon are you footprint are you having per square meter or per room night? So those things are all procedures that are actually well defined on how to do that. And the good thing is that we have not just committed to be net zero by 2050, but we did that and we submitted our plan to an institute which is called the Science Based Target Initiative. And they are kind of an organization that checks on the quality of your targets and the quality of your progress. So we have to submit every year our progress to them. And what is great is that is actually the framework for companies, the private sector, to stay in line with the commitments that were taken at the COP21 in Paris, which is the 1.5 degree target. Yeah. So it actually connects what companies are doing to what the world leaders and the countries are doing so through that methodology. I wanted to ask you about that actually, because when we were talking about COP earlier, you spoke about your peer group in private sector that it gives you a fantastic level of access to and the relationships that you can create. What about the interaction between the private sector and the governmental influence, the world leaders, heads of state? What's your feeling about what COP facilitates in terms of enhanced collaboration between those two parties? Well, I think, um, First of all, the private sector has a space here, which is good, uh, because very often uh, what I see, and I see that at the European level, but I also see it elsewhere, is that uh, institutions, lawmakers, they have the best intentions and really do, because I applaud everything that's going on, for example, in the European Union. A lot of new regulation is coming to help us transition to that net zero economy also, create jobs, protect jobs, etc. So a lot of good stuff is happening, but they don't take into account the expertise of the private sector enough. Uh, and specifically tourism, because let's face it, it's a complex industry. You've got everyone in the value chain. You have the tour operators, you have the booking platforms, you have the hotels. So it's, it's actually quite a complex industry. Um, although we do represent 10% of global GDP, and 10%, one in 10 jobs globally is in tourism. Wow. The, the ecosystem of tourism, right? Huge. And travel. So that's huge. 
but we we are not present enough. And I think opportunities like here, but other opportunities that we also are seeking with Radisson is to have that conversation and actually make uh, policymakers understand that we work together really well in the industry, that we do things for the greater good, that we have tools, that we have standards that actually can serve the lawmakers in their process. Yeah. Do you think COP will facilitate the kind of progress that you're looking for? Well, I'm not at a high level enough to be in front of the real decision makers, I think. Uh, I think COP is also a little bit too big, mm. but maybe through the associations that I mentioned before, through bodies like the United Nations World Tourism Organization, just making sure that they are our voice, the voice of the nations, the voice of the destinations, the voice of the private sector. That helps. It helps. It does help. Yeah, absolutely. Inga, we started this conversation talking about what inspired you to follow the career path that you followed and that you clearly know so much about. You've certainly educated me in the course of this dialogue. I'd like to finish by asking you a personal question again. If you could offer the younger you one piece of advice, what would it be? I would say trust your intuition and believe that you can do it. Inga, thank you so much for your time on this podcast. It's been a personal and professional pleasure. Real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.